joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let receive her key let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing let heaven and nature sing let heaven Vaughn and heaven and nature sing. He rules the world mm. with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his right righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love <laughs> Oh, Jesus, joy. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, I can see pictures of joy bells ringing everywhere from the heaven down to earth. It's like a big sled of bells of joy just coming down from the heavens down into the earth, just ringing all around us, praise God. So do you hear them? <laughs> Hallelujah. The joy bells, joy to the world. Christ uh, is here. Christ is coming. Christ is coming to speak again. Yet another moment today, praise God. Thank God for that. I can't explain the angelic sounds from heaven to earth just changing and transforming our hearts. So we thank God. I want to open up in a quick prayer for those of you on this December 13th of 2020. Man, just a few more days left, 18 more days or so. But anyway, God bless. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Yes, we thank you for this joy. My God. Uh, may the joy crush the darkness. Yes, may this joy crush ill will. May this joy crush depression. Lord, let your joy come in and resurrect the hearts and the souls and the minds of your people today. Hallelujah. Even those that we encounter, God, let our lives be an honest and a truthful expression of joy that transforms and that changes the world. Lord, we are living epistles, O oh God, so that your Holy Spirit in us is God, is Jesus' testimony on earth. So God, when they see us, let people see joy to the world, for the Spirit of the Lord has come through our lives. God, we bless you. We thank you for today. You. Um, let those hearers who are here um, in this original live broadcast and those who would listen by replay at, at a later time, Father, just open up the hearts and the ears of your hearers today so that the word of the Lord can go forth and strengthen their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm so excited. First of all, <laughs> I want to uh, give honor today to my father in love who has had a heavenly birthday. I think this is his 10th heavenly birthday today. So we thank God for him. I know him and my dad are palling around up there with Christ and having a good time. Praise God. So anyway, I'm excited about the message we have had. I would, If you were in this room, I would ask you, how many people have enjoyed what they've been hearing and been enriched by what they've heard of this last part of this series? Yes. Oh, my. Yeah. You can answer online. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are in a... Still in the pandemic, but while we're in the pandemic, we are, don't have to be lost of joy or be, you know, doormats or be bored or be basic. We can enjoy our lives and have the fullness of God's joyful expression through us, even though we're indoors and protecting our lives so that we can continue 
to have a joyful life. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Anyway, there was the message again, Ministering with Prophetic Clarity, Part 5. And I would put, if I had a subtitle, I would say, Order in Heaven's Court on Earth. Order in the Court. Hallelujah. So anyway, but this morning I have to sidebar and share with you what the Holy Spirit gave me this morning. And I just realized that actually this was a great opening line for our message for today. Okay. Some of you might have seen it because I posted it. It said, Christ has not called us to be snake charmers. <laughs> you don't cohabitate with vipers. <laughs> Ain't that fun? Mm -hmm. You don't have to sit there and act as though you have to partake and participate and sit around people who are snakes mm -hmm. or have the spirit of a serpent in their lives. For example, I'm going to read the scripture that Jesus said, and this is going to open us up before we get into our primary teaching. If we go into Matthew chapter 12, Verse 33 and 34. I'll pause in my voice for a second so you can let that message sink in. Christ has not called us to be snake charmers. All right. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 33 and 34. I'm going to read in this particular instance uh, out of the King James. It says... And you can read it. I would love to read. Um, let's go up to verse 31, okay? Wherever I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That's Jesus talking. And verse 33, neither make the tree, excuse me, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else the tree or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. And here comes the one, here comes that mic drop, as they would say. O oh, generation of vipers, as Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. O oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Is either left or right? I mean, I shouldn't say, it's either here or over here. I don't even want to say left or right, because everybody want to misconstrue that as something political, and it is not. All right? Christ has not called us to be snake charmers. You don't cohabitate with vipers. You know, Jesus himself said that you cannot make someone evil just because they're speaking good and they just inherently evil doesn't make that person a good person. Point blanky. Just a private thought I had in my head throughout the week. I said that, you know, we're supposed to pray for leaders. You know, pray for those in leadership and pray for those. Just pray, period. And all this prayer we've been praying for leadership, the, it has been a consistent well of evil things coming out of this individual, out of the leaders, even after all this prayer. And that's something that has got me, and that was just a private thought. I just opened my private thoughts to you publicly and share with you that, yes, you can pray for people. Yes, you can do all these things, but if a person is inherently evil, no matter if they try to say something good for a moment, 
you know, maybe that moment and that very word isolated in an island by itself is good. But that does not make the individual a good person. Jesus Christ said that. Go ahead, prophet. And to your point, I want to read it in the in the message because it really drives home this the point you're making. Mm -hmm. It says it's your heart. Reading from Matthew uh, twelve thirty four and through thirty seven, it's your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. Mm. So I can pray all day, but if I'm praying amiss, if I'm praying with the wrong intent, if I'm praying misaligned to the very will and purpose of God, again, it's your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. A good person produces good deeds and words. Here's the clincher. Season after season. <laughs> See, if it's a if it's a good tree, that means every season you go to that tree is going to be something good on that tree. That's good. Not just a one time harvest, but it is season after season. An evil person is a blight on the orchard. <laughs> oh. Every one of the careless words will come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. So a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. The fruit tells you about the tree. Exactly. If you, you can have a couple of good apples on a blighted tree. But if everything else coming off the tree, all the fruit is rotten, then the person then the person realizes that there's something wrong with the tree because it's not producing season after season. It's not producing good. It's not producing consistent good fruit. And there's season after season. If there's a consistent evil, season after season, after season, after year, after speech, after speech, after rally, after elections, <laughs> okay, that should tell you that Jesus was talking about the very fruit of an individual. And we have seen one thing 2020 has shown us. 2020 has shown us. It has opened up the curtain. We have seen backstage of who is inherently good and who is inherently evil. It has been a very clear. I mean, that stage presence was has been really something in 2020. But God has said, Jesus himself has said that if someone is trying to speak good things and evil, the only thing that's producing from them is evil. And you know them by the fruit. Look at the just look at 2020 and look at the fruit of actions of the evil. Literally, we have people murdering folks in the street. And people heralding it as something good and making a hero out of that and making it a Christian cause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get out. And then you want to talk about abortion. You, we want to talk about questioning people whether they are Christian because uh, of a stance on abortion. But you inherently support and fund people who murder folks in the street and call that person a hero. That is season after season of bad fruit. Anyway. Christ did not call us to be snake charmers, which means the Lord has spoken to me and said that you don't have to be an entertainer of people whose life is centered around deception. Mm -hmm. Many people in this, and Holy Spirit, thank you right now. Many people have, be, many people who say they are prophets have done nothing but become snake charmers. They entertain things so people can look at the at the at the uh, tricks that the snake can do. My God. The Holy Spirit said that we're not here to bring out tricked out snakes. Because the only thing that's gonna happen once you turn off the charm, they're gonna bite you. Mm. And all they do is have them. One case example of snake charming, and I will say this, you can look at the Supreme Court. Let's look at that as a, as a case example. Snake charming went on to get a Supreme Court nominee into the court. 
And right after the court acceptance occurred and there was time to look at different laws or different cases coming up, one of the biggest cases in American history was just rejected on Friday in American history. And on, since Friday, this snake charming in the, you know experience that someone produced, the snake has come to bite them. The venom has come out against this woman. This is a case example why you cannot be a snake charmer. You don't want to get your life to be centered around entertaining people whose sole mission is to bring venom into the earth. Jesus called the generation in his day, all the, he was speaking to spiritual leaders. I mean, not spirit, he was speaking to religious leaders. He wasn't speaking to millennials. He wasn't speaking to the young folk. He wasn't speaking to young people. He wasn't speaking to the unsaved. He was speaking to those who were espoused in religion. Steeped. Steeped in religion. The he called scholars and the doctors. The scholars and the doctors. Of religion. Yeah. You know, if there was a, if there was a broadcast network, a TBN back then, that's who he was speaking to. Those who were in the leadership and, and carried the voice of religion throughout the earth. Jesus called them vipers. Vipers is one high class level snake. <laughs> it's venom will take you out in minutes. So that <laughs> is the entry word for us to understand before we get into our message today. Don't be a snake charmer. If you know something is entangled in venomous, deceptive tactics, do not use your life. Do not use your voice to entertain such a thing. That is the word of the Lord today. Received. My God. All right, now on to our message, Ministry and Prophetic Clarity. Hopefully that was clear enough for you. <laughs> what is God's order? How does God deal with prophets? Because God is a God of decency and of order. And what is his order? Okay. So one of the first things God really, really dealt about as far as this series, this segment of our series dealing with order um, there's a certain order to receiving a prophet, okay? Because everybody thinks just because you're a prophet, you're supposed to receive them, you're supposed to just take them in, you're supposed to let them be, you know, heralded and put on the pedestal, okay? God has given his people a voice when it comes to accepting or rejecting prophecy, okay? So, um, let me just, let me turn to it here. Deuteronomy Chapter 13. We know this is Old Testament. This was the time before there was a dispensation of grace. Okay? So, but the Bible does say, the New Testament says, the authors say that the Old Testament was a schoolmaster for us to understand. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So when we speak about things in Deuteronomy and the, the laws that Moses enacted as he was led by God to be God's prophetic voice for that hour, we take those words and we understand the tone behind the words, not so much the punishments behind the actions, because we're in a dispensation of grace. Like I said in the very beginning, as we read, there's things that Jesus forgive all the way up to um, speaking against the Son of God. He forgave Peter. He even forgave Judas. But you can't... Look, as we said earlier, speaking against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven on earth or in heaven. Go ahead, Prophet. And as, and as you're saying that, I want people to understand what that means. Because when you reject the Holy Spirit, you're actually repudiating the, the one who actually allows you to for, be forgiven. Mm. We receive Christ by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So if you reject the one who opens the door, you don't go through the door. Mm -hmm. 
That's what that means. You can't, you can't go through a door that you reject. You can't go through a door that you don't open. See, the Holy Spirit is got like we talked about this early in our series. The Holy Spirit is God's voice. It's God's very voice in the earth. Just how the Holy Spirit came upon Mel Dad and Edad and the seventy in the days of Moses is the same Holy Spirit that spoke that came down on the hundred and twenty, and they begin to speak from the Holy Spirit. And so if you reject the speaking of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, that's, that's it could be challenging for your life. You're actually sawing off the branch that you're sitting on. <laughs> that's what you do. If you re, when you reject the voice of the Spirit which Christ has sent into the earth, that's how we receive him by the Holy Spirit. If you reject the Holy Spirit, you're sawing off the branch that you're sitting on. So there can't be redemption because you're severing your connection with the one who opens the door to redemption. Exactly. All right. So let me read this out of Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5, okay? And we're talking about order right now. And here is a good example of order. If there arise a prophet among you or a dreamer of dreams... And he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign and wonder comes to pass. Now, you know, we talk about we talked about in the past not coming to pass, but it says comes to pass. So pause right there. Because wherever you are today, I need you to write this down. Put it in your knower. Because many people are being deceived by this very thing. False prophets can give true words. Put that somewhere. Write it down somewhere. Because we often say, well, they must be a true prophet because it came to pass. False prophets can give true words. Remember what we just discussed in Matthew 12. It's not about the one true word. It's about what are they doing season after season. Go ahead, Pastor. So, all right. If the sign or the wonder comes to pass, where he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Here is the order. Here is the order. Okay. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so this is what I want to interject here before I go on the Lord says that he sometimes comes to prove you so there may be a false prophet allowed within your midst to say that God said this and God said that and God saith and God saith and thus saith and la 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 and things happen and the end result of that turns out to be murderous nationalism for example or to be sexual exploitation or to be kidnapping or to be in slavery or something Doors against the Lord God. Go ahead. And so again, false prophets can give you a true word and they can lead a false life. Right. And God comes to prove us. And here's what he's asking. Ultimately, are you following me or are you following prophecy? Right. Are you falling in love with God or are you falling in love with prophetic utterances? Because we have a whole nation right now of people who are in love with prophecy. They're in love with prophetic utterances. And, and this is a time of proving. So what I'm saying is, like, for example, um, people say, well, this person will be president or that person will be whatever. Okay. And, and this person goes and gets into office, for example. And from day one, 
today, year four, they lead you away from the spirit of God for four entire years, you can know that you do not need to hearken to that individual or the words that they share. Because God says in verse 4, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, obey his voice. You shall serve him and cleave unto him. But here's what happens. This is the thing that we have to understand. But, excuse me, and that prophet or dreamer of dreams, look at this. And this is Old Testament now, so it's very strong. But it says, and that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. That is the kicker. There are people who have been sent by hell, by this, by the uh, the kingdom of darkness, to turn you away from the Lord God. You saying things that come to pass. Okay, now look at this. Let me keep reading the verse. That prophet, the dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death because he has spoken, or she has spoken, to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way of the Lord thy God, command thee to walk in. So shall, so shall thou put the evil away from the midst of of the, okay? This is prophetic order, okay? Now, God is not a respecter of persons. He just will not, this is the message. We're not here to murder people, okay? We're not here to put people to death. That's not what Christ came to do. Christ came to give life. But what we do is that he will not tolerate people leading you away from his will in the name of being a prophet. We don't like I said, we don't go around murdering people, but we can be sure to terminate that voice in our hearts and our minds and our sphere. I was going to say, you know, in terms of how does this translate to where we are now? It's talking about considering that word, considering that voice non-existent exactly. in determining your future. It should not be a factor in your future. And it goes on, and I don't, I don't know if you're going to read further in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 13, but in 6 through 10, it's not just the prophet that, that the man of God is addressing. He says, and when your brother or son or daughter or even your wife or lifelong friend comes to you in secret and whispers, Let's go and worship some other gods, gods that you know nothing about, neither you nor your ancestors, the gods of the people near and far from one end of the earth to the other. Don't go along with them. Right. So it's talking about not just the person who says something that comes to pass. It's talking about where does that person lead you after the word? Where is their life leading you after the word? One more time. Where is their life leading you after the word? So it's a false life that's being addressed. Mm -hmm. False prophets are, is not just about the, the prophetic utterances, but it is the falsehood of, of their life. It is where they're telling you to go after delivering a word to you. Right. So what we have to understand is that you know, in Moses' day, they put him to death. That was a very public process. That was nothing secret. It was nothing hidden. It was nothing private. As I say today, we terminate that voice in our heart, in our mind, in our sphere, and our community. If you know that there's someone in there that is speaking you to lead you away from God, the Lord says you must address that publicly. It's a very public process. It's not a thing of secrecy. You don't just go to someone who's leading people away from God in secret and just tell them, you know, hey, you know, um, you know, I think you're wrong. And they go about keep doing their thing and nobody has any type of, the sheep have no real accountability to 
I mean, there's no real accountability about this wolf that's in the presence. There's wolf and sheep clothing. That's Christ said that himself. So what happens is we have to make sure and be clear. That's one thing that Prophet Shante, Shante and I, that's one thing that we have determined over the years, not determined, but the Holy Spirit has made sure and lead us to, to let us understand that if someone is leading you away from Christ, particularly those who are saved there in a spiritual leadership position, you must address it. It cannot be something that is secret-coded or, or just put in secret or discarded. It must not. People must not be led away from God. And we have seen that, particularly from 2015 to now. We have seen where people have used religious and spiritual jargon to lead people away from God. Matter of fact, the end result, look at this. See, the end result of false prophetic words coming to pass from 2015 till now has led people at the end of the day to be anarchists. Mm -hmm. To be against governmental order. To be against their neighbor. To get into the spirit of murdering people. Matter of fact, there's a preacher. Several. Or, several. Me? There are several. Several preachers have come and said that you need to go out and literally have the government assassinate people who don't believe like them. Mm -hmm. That's what the end of all this prophetic truth that came to pass when we saw this election season that had just ended last month. People's heart have been led away from God into superiority, power, and violence. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Prophet. I was going to say, you have several um, leaders that are calling for uh, people who are not conservative or people who are not Republicans. I've, you know, I've actually listened and, you know, some of them are calling for people to be killed. Some of them are saying, oh, they don't believe like us. Let's line them up and, and use a firing squad. Um, some of them are calling for secession from the union. Like this is the lawlessness that's going on, quote unquote, in the name of God, because they feel as though, um, God has quote unquote, given them the right to do these things. However, we know that these things actually go against the word of God itself. That's the word. See, that's it. That's it. You said the word. It goes, I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off. It goes against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to expand the ministry of Christ, which is life and life more abundantly. Okay. From the womb to the tomb. So now, if you are saying that you are speaking against the Holy Spirit, and you are against what the Holy Spirit is here to do, and you're saying that you are God and you're doing very things contrary and very much against what the voice of God is about, that is not forgivable. We made that clear in Jesus' own words. That is why, as prophets, just as it was in the days of Elijah, as it was in the day of Jeremiah, as it was in the days of Jesus, he was not tone deaf, neither did he muzzle his tongue, to speak out against those who are leading people away from God into self-absorbency and sin. Just how it is today. To have order means that you must be able to bring prophetic clarity to people in leadership who are leading you against the Holy Spirit and the will of God. It was just that simple. So we have seen such a misalignment we had one profound 
a long-standing leader broadcast network talking about God will intervene on the Supreme Court to endorse quote unquote supremacy, violence, and and the things that go with that considered as conservative. That is totally false. Anyway, <laughs> that is phase one of our teaching today. Okay? I pray that you understand what we're saying. We're not saying that you are to attack people physically um, and to bring violence to people. But when people are leading you away from God, you are to make a clear pronunciation of clarity that they are leading people away from God. And that voice and those actions, no matter how sincere or how real they may seem, do not lead people into a relationship enriching experience with Christ. Okay? Go ahead, Prophet. I mean, the, the, the reality is... Obviously, we are not in the Old Testament. So no one is, is and it, it's ironic because the very things that under grace is no longer being enacted, those are the very things that people want to enact. You have people who are saying, if you don't believe what I believe, I want to treat you like an Old Testament situation. But we're in the dispensation of grace. And so... If you go back again and you look at the rest of Deuteronomy 13, it tells you that the result of this, it tells you that the result of people coming into a community and getting the citizens of a community to, to move away from God, to go worship other gods, it tells you the result is destruction. Mm -hmm. That's the end result. The destruction of the city, the destruction of the citizens. That would have been, if we were in Old Testament times, that would have been the result. They would have had to destroy everything connected to that false leadership and that false voice. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at our response now, we can't be in cahoots. We can't be in league. As I believe someone said uh, recently, you can't sit down and have tea and crumpets with someone who is in direct opposition to the voice of God right. for your life. Exactly. This is not this is not one of those things where you compromise. You don't compromise with evil. And the Old Testament draws a very distinct picture for us of how they were supposed to treat evil when it began to come into the midst of the community. They had to eradicate it. They had to get rid of everything connected to it. And so it just shows that we can't compromise with an agenda, with a message that goes against the voice of God in our in our life. If you go against heaven's court, the end result is like building your house on sand. When it's tested and tried, there's no foundation for you to stand on or for what you have built to stand on. So why spend all your life and all your heart and all your spirit building on something that's going to fail? At the first wind. That's the mercy of God. He's there to help you understand that don't listen to these voices. So, so many people, particularly in our season, we see the, the political polar, polarization that's occurred. And where people have come into a position where they don't even want to deal with political party. They just want to deal with the voice of false prophecy. That's like a, a third party. It's like it's become... Mm -hmm. It's not left, it's not right, it's just this lawlessness party. And even as we have seen, we have seen people on the left and on the right kind of come together and recognize, wait a minute now, um, for our civilization, for our communities, for our nation to survive, we have to be united. Even though there may not be things to go where we exactly want it to go, we don't sit there and endorse Lawlessness, because lawlessness will destroy your environment from corner to corner. And that's what God didn't want. He didn't want it back then. He doesn't want it for 2020 or 2021. So let's be clear. All right. And I'm not endorsing any political party whatsoever. <laughs> I just don't. I don't. All right. Anyway, let's go to the next, our next segment. 
Hallelujah. Hopefully you got something out of that. If you got something out of that, wave your hand or give a heart or give some kind of response in there on our uh, in our live media chat rooms. Okay? Hallelujah. Now, one thing that we have to understand is that why God is so significant about dealing with prophets is that God has set a prophet in a specific order. You know, you have a scripture as Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians 12. He talked about order within structure. You know, because we have, it's like for instance, we have, yes, you have spiritual leaders, yes, you have things, but there is an order to how you do things, okay? Um, just how you have um, mayors and you have commissioners, just how you have a president and a vice president and you have all these things. You know, there is a specific order that God has in how he administers his 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 voice, okay? Particularly when it comes to corporate settings. This is particularly when it comes to corporate settings, all right? Look at this, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. I'll read that. It says, God has set some in the church, first apostles. And really some in the ecclesia. Ecclesia. Uh, yes, ecclesia. God has set some in the ecclesia, that is the body of Christ, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts and healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, read Ephesians 4, verses 10 through 16. It says that he that descended, Christ who came down to earth, it is saying that went up to heaven, that he might, look at this, fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And this is the key here. Verse 12, 4 the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the work of serving. For the edifying, strengthening, building of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of faith. Hear that again. Unity. Unity of faith. Unity. And the knowledge of the Son of God. So that's the end result here. Knowledge of the Son of God, not some culture, not some racial hierarchy or anything like that, but knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure and stature and the fullness of Christ, that we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the cunning, excuse me, by the slight of men, slight of deception. And cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So in other words, what God is doing is that he has put apostles and prophets, a fivefold ministry, in order so that we don't wind up being taken out by vipers. Go ahead. And I want to be clear because people butcher. <laughs> they butcher the meaning of this, of this particular text. Yeah. When it says, first apostles secondarily prophets third and after that and after that it's talking about the order of how the house the spiritual house of god is built it's talking about the order as in function and placement it is not talking about importance exactly That's it is not saying apostles are more important than prophets it. it is not saying apostles are more important than teachers it's saying if you think about the structure of a spiritual house you put the foundation in first you don't put a roof on you put a foundation in and that foundation for god's spiritual house is the apostle and the prophet it does not mean that the roof is greater than the foundation. It means that without all of them, you cannot have a spiritual house. Exactly. Exactly. So what happens is when it comes down to God's order, many people want to dismiss those who are prophets. They would say, we don't need prophets here. We don't need the voice of the Lord. Go somewhere else. So what you're actually in essence saying is that we don't need maturity. We don't need maturity. <laughs> we don't need foundation. Mm -hmm. We don't need stability. We don't need structure. Mm 
Because mm -hmm. foundation is structural. If there's no structural beginning, then everything is crumbled. Who goes out, like, you know, in my field, we sit there and spend, you know, we deal with contract, we deal with tell contractors how to build stuff, you know, and probably some multi, who, what, what investor or developer is going to have you go out and spend millions of dollars and you have no foundation for the building? Profit. And to bring it even more simpler than that, most people know the story of the three little pigs. <laughs> we know what happened when they built their house on, on some sticks and some straw. Very simple, right? We got to have foundation. And, and going back to the text, it says, for the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting does not mean you get everything right. It's talking about maturity. It's talking about development. If you think about a child being developed, it goes through stages of development. So if you're kicking out parts of the body, you're kicking out the parts of the, of the body that's supposed to function to bring you to a place of maturity. What's another, what's another sign that you have false prophets in your midst? Because the words they're speaking is not bringing the body to a place of maturity. And see, the other thing about it is there's, there's no, and this is the other thing that's very important. With foundation, concrete is comprised of rock, you know, stones, sand, silt, and all those things, okay? So you can't just, the composition of the foundation has to be complete. You just can't say I'm the chief apostle or I'm the bishop or whatsoever, and you don't have the prophet. The stone... <laughs> The very stone that people want to reject. Christ was a prophet. All right. And our chief apostle. So we have to understand we cannot extract or dismiss prophetic ministry if we want foundation in spiritual life. One more thing before you move on from this particular text. I want to point out that it says till we all come. And the unity of the faith, not the unity of our dress code, <laughs> not the unity of even our man-made traditions. You can wear a dress. You can't wear a dress. You must wear pants. Your pants must be cut off at your ankles. You're, you're like till we all come in the unity of the faith. Of the son of man. So we have to recognize. And understand. What is the faith. What is the faith. Not your opinion. Not your preferences. Not your. What is the unity of the faith. Of the knowledge of the son of man. Are we maturing. In the knowledge of the son of man. Do we know more about our pastor. Than we know about Christ. What are we actually maturing in? We have to get back to what was the heart and what was the intent of Christ sending his five-fold ministry ascension gifts into the earth. So what happened, as Prophet Shante was saying, is that we don't sit there and prophesy culture. Tradition and culture, there's... The, you know, as we've seen, one of the greatest errors of Western civilization is trying to identify um, Christianity or the faith as something being Eurocentric. And that promotion of Eurocentrism, people think that that is faith when that is not. Because mm -hmm. now what we're seeing in 2020, we're seeing Eurocentrism as a culture being identified as the faith and how it is crumbling. Because at the end of the day, all we see is unfettered violence as a result of promoting a culture as the gospel. So part of order is, is being clarified. We've got to make sure we're clear that we're not prophesying culture, that we're not prophesying uh, racial identity, that we're not trying to prophesy something that is not faith. Oh, my God. 
I want to I want to speak to that really quickly. Um, and this is in the news. You can actually you can look this up. The, the city of Minnesota, a, a, a town in Minnesota, to speak to what you just said, has approved a conditional permit to allow the use of a church building by a whites only religious organization known as the Asa True Folk Assembly. This is their mission statement. This is their ministry statement. The religion by which the ethnic European folk have traditionally related to the divine and to the world around them. It is part of the great Aryan religiosity. This is their ministry statement. It is exactly what you just talked about. It is taking a Eurocentric view and saying this is our religious belief system. This is hap this is just posted December 10th. This is happening now in real time. This is why we're we're having this conversation. Go ahead. So what we have to understand is that um the whole point is not to be taken by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness. We have seen and we still continue to see craftiness. When you have people in leadership positions, particularly in the level of state attorney, come together and make a, a, an, an alliance with someone who operates with the spirit of lawlessness to come address the highest court supposedly in the land to nullify the whole law of the land so that they can maintain a position of lawlessness that is cunning craftiness. Because one thing that that spells, number one, Prophet Shante says all the time, racism or culturalism is spelled P-O-L-I-C-Y, policy. The way people use policy is based on cunning craftiness and slight. I'm not in the law field, but I know a ton of attorneys, and one of the major aspects of law is how to interpret that law. People will try to use cunning craftiness to misinterpret a law so that they can have their personal lawless behavior established Perfect. and fulfilled in the earth. That is deception. That is viperism. That is what we don't charm. We don't sit there and put our tools of our lives and our ministry into a position where we try to make the snake dance. <laughs> I thank the Holy Spirit for that. I mean, I thank God. You know, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But one thing I thank God for that in all the failures we may have had individually, professionally, personally, corporately, that his spirit is still with us. We can repent and he will still show us and still lead us and still tell us the truth. That was a powerful Holy Spirit led word that I got this morning that I'm understanding more as we minister today. But at the end of the day, we have to understand we must speak the truth in love. We must grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, verse 15. From whom the whole body, here it is, from whom the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to effectual working measure of every part. Make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, one of the things that's why you know that it is an uh, uh, a mission of the kingdom of darkness to nullify votes, particularly on the political cycle, is what they're trying to do. They're trying to nullify the measure of every part. Mm -hmm. People have taken their, they have put their faith into the institution of voting for leadership. God said, pray for your governments. Governments are there for evil, not for good. 
They're there to stop evil, not promote evil. That's what governments are for. You got to read your book, read your Timothy's, or read read your Bible. <laughs> okay. So governments are there to stop evil, not to promote evil. So it is evil to promote the dismissing of voices who are there to oust evil. It's the same context here in this scripture, is that the whole purpose of apostles, prophets, the fivefold ministry is to make sure that we preach and speak the word of God so that everybody can come and be a part and effective measure of Christ. That's what culturism, culturalism, racism, sexism, and all those things does. What it does, it tries to exclude the measure of every part. Throughout Eurocentrism, they try to exclude that which is done by black humans as something valued to Christ. That's what we have to put to death. Voices that promote division and that various people can't minister and share God's heart and be a part of the measure and stature of Christ. Go, Prophet. And again, I, I, I love to go back and reiterate what the text is saying. It's telling us the whole body is fitly joined. Right. No part left behind. That's exactly. Every part of God's body is important. There is no little I and there is no big U. Everybody has a particular function. Everyone has a particular voice. And you, and you said that so profoundly. Evil and the works of evil are about dismissing voices that are there to oust evil. Right. Last thing I want to say, when, how do we know we're in the body? Number one, the body is increasing, but it's increasing because it's edifying itself in love. Mm -hmm. It's not increasing through excluding people. And hating people and wanting to kill people, wanting to destroy people. So what's your increase bringing about? What is the fruit of your increase? What is the root of your increase? We saw recently how people... Uh, left one social platform, right, to go join another social platform. And they said that platform went from a few thousand people to about a million people overnight. But the platform was centered around, we want to express our most vilest opinions. We want to express, we want the right to express our vulgarity. We want the right to express our racism and our prejudice. So it blew up to a million people overnight. And in the past couple of weeks, it has gone from a million people to about 400,000. It shrunk again. Why did it shrink? Because it wasn't an edification in love. Right. It grew, but the whole point behind it was I want the right to be evil. I want the right to, to, to say things and to dehumanize people and to degrade people. So again, when we're talking about the body, it's supposed to be edifying itself in love. What is your what is your final aim? We know that the aim of prophecy, the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. What is your prophecy testifying about? What is your prophecy leading men to? Is it leading people to a knowledge and understanding of Christ? Is it maturing them in the things of Christ? Is it edifying people in love? Because if it's not doing that, then you got to ask yourself, is it prophecy or is it the soulish musings of my heart or the soulish musings of my mind? What is this actually that I'm declaring and speaking to people? The one thing I appreciate and I see it and I'm speaking from a prophetic standpoint, not from a cultural standpoint, is to see how... Leadership is forming using different identities represented in America. You have the first female vice president. You have a, her first Hispanic um, leader of a, I forget which, uh, which cabinet post he was putting into. But you're starting to have a measure of various cultures, uh, uh, um, uh, ethnicities coming together 
to make the nation better overall. The same thing with Christ. That's where it comes from. It's like when you look at the body of Christ, the body of Christ takes the collective of all its pieces and parts from the toenail, you know, to, to the pinky toe, you know, to the tibula and the fibula, uh, to the femur and to the you know pelvic and all those things. And we come together, all those joints and all those parts, and we come and we put them all together. And we make an engine that works well. And that is something you cannot exclude. When you make exclusions, you're actually amputating yourself. We're not here to destroy the measure and stature of Christ. We are here to build to the measure and stature of Christ. Prophet. Revelation 7, verse 9 through 12. I looked again. I saw a huge crowd, too huge to count. Everyone was there. We're talking about what is, what is the heart of God. Everyone was there. All nations and tribes, all ethnos and languages. And they were standing, dressed in white robes, waving palm branches, standing before the throne and the lamb and heartily singing, salvation to our God on his throne, salvation to the lamb. All who were standing around the throne, angels, elders, animals, fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, oh yes, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, the honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever and ever, oh yes. Uh, everybody was there. Again. What is the word coming to do? It's coming to bring all of God's body together. So when you find yourself dealing with people who claim to be of God and they're operating in an exclusionary manner, they're excluding parts of the body while saying that they're of God, you automatically know it's not of God. Because God says, I'm bringing every tribe, tongue, language, and people group. That's a wrap for today. God's order is collecting all his pieces and putting the puzzle together. Putting the pieces of God together. That's what prophets do. That's what prophets help bring foundational work to. We don't sit there and try to exclude and dismiss and belittle and disgrace degrade those who are in Christ. For example, just a couple days ago, and I'll close on this, I was in my physical therapy, which I'm dismissed now. I've been um, dismissed from it after my uh, scope I had in April, August. Um, there was a couple of men who looked like rednecks. They looked like flaming rednecks. Looked like they could have been cons um, part of the Confederacy. I was speaking about various things while I was there in the center. These two guys were smiling so big and so happy because they were deeply appreciating the words that I was saying as it dealt with the function of the body, <laughs> the human body. The amount of joy that they had, I had to tell them, man, you're smiling really big. He said, man... And they were just talking about how much of a joy, how much energy they received from what I was saying about being able to function well. And that's what the end of the day is about. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican. It matters whether you're in Christ and you're built up in the image of Christ and you're working together to bring God's image, not a nationalism image, not an image of America, not an image of Europe, not an image of whatever, just the image of Christ united. And more, and more importantly, for those who are not in Christ, you are still God's unique creation in the earth. Amen. And you have value. Mm -hmm. And your life matters too. 
And so even as we are in Christ, we recognize and we honor the image bearers that God has created. Another sign that you're dealing with someone false is because they only acknowledge specific bearers of image of God. They don't acknowledge that God has created man in his image and God, in his likeness. God said all souls are mine. And what he does, he uses his body to build his body. So as we are functioning as a body, then the body expands. And how does it expand? By reaching those souls that are his to come and join into the building process and be a part of the body of Christ. That's what it's about. So I pray <laughs> that you got encouraged today by the message of order and God's order. <laughs> that we don't entertain snakes. And that we're here to unite, to build up, not to destroy people. That's our bullet points for today. So I'll pray. I'll have Shante pray. Prophet Shante pray us out. And have a magnificent December 13th, 12 days before Christmas. Enjoy your time. Don't go from bananas. <laughs> but enjoy every and save every moment of family time. The, 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 the giving spirit. It's not Christ's birthday on, on, on <laughs> December 25th, but the love of Christ is one thing that we can exemplify in the holiday season. Go ahead, Prophet. We honor his birth and we honor his life. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your grace on today. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you <sighs> desire to care for us, that you desire to speak to us. We thank you, Father. We don't take it for granted that you've given us life and you've given us another opportunity to share in the word, to seek your face, to uh, collectively respond to your heart. And Father, we pray for your people now, God, that you would um, keep them from the false. Keep them from the false. We pray, Father, for discernment, the ability to know good from evil, the ability to know right from wrong. The ability to recognize a falsehood from a truth. Lord, we pray that you continue, God, to expand that anointing, expand that knowledge, expand that wisdom, expand that grace. And Father, those who may not be feeling well in their bodies, Lord, we pray that you extend your hand of healing yes. and health. Bring them back to a place of health and strength, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord that we want to follow you, that we're not going to be uh, taken off and veering into another path, but we want to make sure, God, that, that our hearts are following you and not just following prophecy, that we're in falling in love with you, Father, and not just a prophetic word or a prophetic utterance. Father, we pray that you would continue to bring this nation back to a place of truth. Lord, we've been, we have been assaulted by the spirit of deception and lies throughout this nation. And so, Father, we need a cleansing. We need a washing as a nation, as a people, from the, from the layers of falsehood, from the layers of deception. Father, help people to cast those things off. Let the eyes of the deceived become open again. Let truth and let righteousness enter their hearts again. Father, this, this spirit of delusion and deception that has cloaked so many, Father, let that cloak be thrown off today. Let the eyes of their understanding be enlightened. Father, let the truth of the gospel come into the hearts and minds of those who say they are yours, who have been deceived in, in various ways. Father, we thank you for your truth because your truth leads men, leads humankind into the righteousness of who you are. Your truth leads people into love. Your truth leads people into peace, into goodness, into righteousness, into clarity. So Father, we thank you for your truth on today. Let your truth be a hedge of protection for those who believe in you. Father, we thank you for everybody 
that you've called into this wonderful body of believers. We thank you, God, for everyone having a voice. We thank you, Father, for every part functioning the way that it's supposed to function. We thank you, Lord, that everybody will find their place, that they will find their value, that they will know that they're, they are valuable to this body. They are valuable to the maturing of the body, to the edifying of the body in love. We need the love that's flowing out of each and every person that you have called to this body. Jesus, Let us not be those that withhold love, but let us all come into the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of Man. We thank you, Lord. It is in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you all for listening today and chiming in with us. Um, this message has been uh, God's heart. I thank God for His heart. Thank God for you listeners. And if you want to participate in giving financially to support the work of Life Nation, which does the work of the kingdom, you can look at it on our uh, chat rooms and they can give you the links. Okay? Praise God for you and have a magnificent December 13th. Amen. Amen.